This week, we're going to be talking about performance art, the wild and wacky and sometimes thought-provoking world of performance art. And to kind of take us back in time, we are going to be starting with Dada. Uh, we're not going to talk much about this time period, but I just want to recognize the fact that it does have its roots in the kind of Dada futurist um, art movements. And uh, there's a a photo of what's thought to be one of the original performance art pieces there in 1922. So performance art is a term originally referring to work that took place live in front of an audience, but has since expanded to describe film, video, uh, photographic and installation based artworks through which these actions of artists, performers or the audience are conveyed. So the you know film video photo or installation can be just as much part of the art um as the performance itself but we still kind of think of um the performance as you know kind of the starting point the key component and we think about this as the happening where the performance art happened uh, we'll hear a little bit more about that um, in the liveness, the physical moment, the impermanence offered artists alternatives to static uh, permanence of painting and sculpture, and it often um, really resists the commercial market, um, except for maybe Jay Z, who we'll see in a little while too, maybe the first to kind of um, kind of monetize uh, performance art. And it has its roots in Dada and Futurism, as I said. And it challenges the conventions of form and aesthetics of art, right? Challenging the conventions and therefore challenging the market as well. Um, and I just kind of want to show this to start because I think it does a good job of showing we have this kind of print of the, uh, or a document of the performance itself. Um, but it is just that it's a document and um, when they were actually making these prints that was the happening that was the performance art and Kendall Jenner does a little series of performance art herself and we'll just watch uh, kind of what she has to say about it <laughs> Performance art is live art by artists. It is not art that hangs on a wall. Rather, it is performed live in front of an audience. The artist's body is the artwork. It can be disturbing, uncomfortable, even dangerous. In the 1960s, for example, the artist Chris Burden had an assistant shoot him in the arm with a real bullet. Yoko Ono knelt on a stage and invited members of the audience to cut off her clothes. Kanye West has called his life walking performance art. Like most art, performance art forces us to think differently. As Yoko put it, Performance art is the future. I've always wanted to be an artist. I mean, being a supermodel is great. Flying on private jets, Carl's my friend. But I think my soul is being an artist. I mean, when you're a model, you're a mannequin for other people. I want to be a director of my own vision now. So I've researched a ton of performance art pieces, and I really want to give an homage to them. <laughs> Yoko Ono's cut piece challenges power dynamics between women and men, performer and audience. Oh, that's a $10,000 dress! Cut! <sighs> Murakami Saburo's performance where he breaks through many sheets of paper is a metaphor for beauty that can emerge from decay. Marina Abramovic and Uli create performances of long duration, pushing the body to extremes. Uh, 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 do I die of wrinkles when I do this? Kinda. Yeah. It's like you're 20 now, no, you know? I know. I just, just don't put to that help. in. Yeah. The makeup wrinkle? Makeup wrinkle. Yeah. yeah. Gross. Thank you. Get in Thank there. You. you just can't wrinkle. You look amazing. Like wrinkle. That. Thank you. So I've been thinking about my first piece, and I'm very inspired. I just want to show my perspective on life. I've got a title for the piece, and I feel like that's always important, right? I'm thinking the selfie. All right, so kind of humorous, and uh, just one of our little pop culture moments for the day, all right? And she mentioned this piece of passing through, and she did a uh, a little, piece, a little bit of it of herself, right? How beauty can rise from decay. Um, and we're going to see this in an upcoming video as well, but it's uh, an early electronic uh, 
flight suit. And, you know, we can't get through a lecture these days without a little uh, video from the art assignment. So um, it's going to be pretty fast. As usual, we're going to kind of see um, a, a massive uh, selection of performance work and we'll talk about a few of them afterwards. But something I want to point out is that um, because the body is the medium of art, it ends up being uh, fairly inherently political at times, right? So, because um, the you can kind of read the body as part of the content. Um, so that's just kind of something to keep in mind as we move forward. You're minding your own business in an art gallery when all of a sudden a movement occurs out of the corner of your eye. It couldn't be. You break into a cold sweat and look around for the nearest exit, but it's too late. It's happening. It's performance art. Why? Why has my precious fourth wall been violated? Why must I be forced to endure this inevitable awkwardness? This is the case for performance art. Performance art is a term used to describe art in which the body is the medium or live action is in some way involved. This is nothing new, of course. Human beings have always performed in front of each other through ritual, storytelling, dance, carnival, and on and on. But as art evolved, the word became known for describing specific things, mainly objects like painting, sculpture, and drawing. Live action belonged to other disciplines like theater and ballet and opera. But during the course of the 20th century, artists began to incorporate live action into works and describe it as art. The Italian futurists in the 19-teens saw performance as the only way to reach a mass audience, staging noise concerts and a kind of disruptive variety theater aimed at destroying, quote, the solemn, the sacred, the serious, and the sublime in art with a capital A. Think artists are kind of nuts? Well, the futurists wanted you to think that, arguing the name of madman with which it is attempted to gag all innovators should be looked upon as a title of honor. Dada artists embraced the crazy as well and built off the popularity of cabaret in post-World War I Germany. Artists Hugo Ball and Emmy Hennings opened Café Voltaire in 1916 in Zurich and invited artists and writers to come give musical performances and readings of all kinds. No one knew what might happen on any given night. It could be like this, or it could be like this. During the Weimar years, the Bauhaus was the first institution to offer a specific performance class, reinforcing it as a medium in its own right. Avant-garde theater flourished across Europe, and early surrealist Antonin Artaud theorized what he called the theater of cruelty, proposing a direct communication between the spectator and the spectacle, engulfing the spectator into the action, writing, we abolish the stage and the auditorium and replace them by a single site without partition or barrier of any kind, which will become the theater of the action. After World War Two, Black Mountain College in the U.S. became a hotbed of experimental interdisciplinary practice, with avant-garde composer John Cage teaching classes and staging collaborative productions. They put on a version of Eric Satie's surreal The Ruse of Medusa, featuring Merce Cunningham as Mechanical Monkey, Buckminster Fuller as Nonsensical Baron, and sets by Willem and Elaine de Kooning. Cage shared with his students his understanding of music as it relates to Zen Buddhism, that art should not be separate from life, but an action within life, with all of the accidents and chaos and occasional beauty that that entails. Participants in his productions were given loose scores that left a lot to interpretation, had unpredictable results, and were impossible to reproduce. Choreographer and dancer Merce Cunningham's revolutionary approach, also shared at Black Mountain, proposed that such ordinary movements as walking and standing could be considered dance. The boom of abstract expressionist painting in the 1950s emphasized the body's involvement in making art. It's obvious but easy to forget when you're looking at, say, a landscape that every painting is a document of a series of actions that took place in the past. But with works like Jackson Pollock's, it becomes harder to ignore, with art critic Harold Rosenberg explaining the canvas began to appear to one American painter after another as an arena in which to act. What was to go on the canvas was not a picture, but an event. The Kutai group in Japan took these ideas a step further. In front of audiences, Kazuo Shiraga threw himself naked into a pile of wet mud. Saburo Murakami crashed through a row of paper screens. Tanaka Atsuko donned her electric dress. Back in Europe, Eve Klein embarked on a series for which he hired female models to cover themselves in paint and make imprints of their bodies on paper. Instead of walking through a room and glimpsing these things that happened in the past, here it is in the room with you, happening right now. The godfather of the happening, Alan Caprow, staged his first in 1959 at Rubin Gallery, stating on the invitation, you will become part of the happenings. You will simultaneously experience them. 
Guests arrive with little idea of what would happen, both witness to and participant in loosely structured actions, left to make of it what they could. Caprow called it what he did because it was, quote, something spontaneous, something that just happens to happen. Artists associated with the Fluxus movement presented ordinary events as art, considering anyone and everyone to be an artist. At a 1962 Fluxus festival, Ben Patterson performed variations for contrabass, where he agitated its strings using a variety of unusual materials. Nam June Paik dipped his necktie and head in paint and drew a line along a 13-foot roll of paper. Allison Knowles made a big salad and shared it. Much of it was playful, but for others, it was dead serious. Joseph Boyes gave lectures and staged dramatic actions, enacting what he called social sculpture to try to change consciousness, believing art can and should transform your everyday life. In Vienna, a group of artists pursued what they called actionism, calling it not only a form of art, but above all, an existential attitude. Hermann Nietzsche enacted ancient rites, which he described as an aesthetic way of praying. And Vali Explore invited the public to reach into a curtain box to touch her unclothed body, a humorous but indicting action questioning the objectification of women's bodies. Performance came into its own in the turbulent 60s and 70s. The civil rights movement and second wave feminism underlined the fact that the body is political and artists seized on its potential. Carolee Schneeman explained, in 1963, to use my body as an extension of my painting constructions was to challenge and threaten the psychic territorial power lines by which women were admitted to the art stud club. Through performance, female bodies and black bodies and queer bodies and bodies that bring together multiple identities could be reclaimed, reasserted, and represented and through many lenses, not just by white men this time, but by the actual persons in question. The minimalists were interested in phenomenology or the study of consciousness from particular points of view, and so were performance artists. Inserting live bodies into artworks was an immediate way to unsettle the delusion that a universal perspective exists, insisting that every body is a self, inscribed by events, language, history, and identity, and is always in perpetual flux. These selves did lots of things. They became part of paintings. They wore paintings. They positioned themselves in space and in nature. They positioned others in space. They performed tasks, and they asked others to perform tasks. They made constructions specifically to hold their bodies. They followed strangers. They took on other identities. They asked questions. They created stores. They subjected themselves to danger. They tested their endurance. They turned the audience into the the performer. They completely merged art and life. They explored desire, androgyny, sexuality, exoticism, and the burden of art historical representation. Since the 70s, performance art has been a relatively constant fixture in the world of art, used internationally to examine a wide range of issues. It's been documented and exhibited, but is largely resistant to commercial forces, offering artists a way to make work outside of the often oppressive market system. Performance today is so many different things. It's Caleb Lindsay singing as his alter ego, the melodramatic chanteuse Taiwan, whom he later declared dead. It's Aloran Calzadilla's Olympic gymnast performing choreographed routines on wooden replicas of airline seats at the Venice Biennale. It's Ryan McNamara being taught to dance in public. It's Kate Gilmore's bright pink house with women in white dresses swinging from its windows. It's Bennett Miller's Dachshund UN. It's Ragnar Kjartansson's Bliss, a 12-hour performance of the last minutes of Mozart's The Marriage of Figaro over and over again. And it's still the classic stuff like Marina Abramovic's wildly popular The Artist is Present, where the audience was invited to queue up and eventually face off with the artist. It should come as no surprise when Jay-Z, inspired by Abramovic's work, called his music video a performance art film, arguing concerts are pretty much performance art with the venues changed. Performance art was born of interdisciplinary thinking and still thrives in those spaces in between. Think art's a scam masterminded by the rich and ridiculous? Well, so have a lot of artists who have used use performance as a strategy to deliberately offend, upend tradition, and remake art from the inside. Performance art was born of a desire to flatten hierarchies inherent in traditional art forms so that the artist could reach an audience directly rather than through coded forms or the separation of a canvas or frame. It wasn't so much that people wanted to make something called performance art, but more that these activities seeped out from other disciplines where they no longer quite fit in. As with any art, it's up to you to decide whether or not you think it's any good. But the way into performance is to allow yourself to be made uncomfortable by it, to admit your feelings of suspicion, fear, dislike, or claustrophobia. Performance art can give you room to think about who you are, where you are, and how you relate to those who are not you. It can allow us to contemplate the rules, written and unwritten, of any given space or place. Performance can make you uncomfortable because that's what it's supposed to do. It's designed to do. Don't leave the room. Stay. 
be uncomfortable. Revel in the mystery of what may or may not occur. Think about why you're feeling the way you're feeling. Invite the discomfort. Invite the unknown. You and artists and art will be better for it. So as always, a really um, kind of brilliant quick overview there. Uh, but I just want to kind of emphasize that, that point that, um, you know, emit your uh, suspicions and uh and try to and try to see past them a little bit i myself uh, i'm pretty uh, hesitant um in in my willingness to engage with performance art um and one time i was at a uh it was like a warehouse show i thought it was just going to be the kind of cool underground uh you know art exhibit with people just kind of mingling and i walk in and there's like acrobatics going on and you know, so it, I'm like, this is one of those moments where your precious bubble, right, is, is about to be violated kind of in some way. And it seems like there's this, uh, this circus Olay act from, uh, that I did not want to get engaged with going on. And they're like swooping down and like grabbing people and pulling them up. And it's like really unclear to me at the moment if, if these people are in on it or if I'm next, right? But what ended up happening was um, just kind of a, a really cool evening after that. People, you know, they shared this experience of kind of um, fear and the unknown, and but you kind of all got through it together. And you ended up having some really kind of um, beautiful conversations that came out of that. And I have also um, found myself, um, you know, but we'll kind of all do one of the Zillars present artists present things later, having just some really kind of uh, wonderful conversations with people um, after that as well. So, um, you know, I just kind of like to you know, give a little bit of transparency with where I'm at with it as well. And that sometimes, you know, just that little bit of suspension of disbelief can, can lead you into something good. Um, so everybody is a self, right? So that's kind of what we're uh, what I mentioned before in the video talked about pretty well too is um, the body it can be inherently political and um, and personal, right? So how is performance art inherently different from other traditional forms of art, right? So we're seeing it. It, it doesn't necessarily have a predictable outcome, right? It doesn't necessarily have a, an object associated with it. And I just ask you why are these differences important, important right? And why does performance art matter? And um, and kind of the last year, last year, how does performance art address contemporary relevant ideas, concepts, and issues? Okay, so how are we seeing performance art uh, address the issues or, um, you know, commentary on contemporary society uh, today? And so um, some things to think about as we move forward. Eve's Klein, Leaping into the Void, this is the famous one. Uh, it was two different photos, right? I don't want to give it away, but no, he did not take the, the concrete to the face, um, but it is a good photo, right? A little bit of a tricky one. We're gonna kind of move over, move kind of quickly over some of these early 1960 ones because they're just so wacky, but it is kind of good to see where, where things um, were at then and where we are now, that kind of a thing. Um, so if I was an artist, and I was in the studio, then whatever I was doing in the studio must be art. <clears throat> At this point, art became more of an activity and less of a product, Bruce Nauman. And this is a little bit of the John Cage um, philosophy, right? Where anything is music. He has a famous composition, um, and I forget the actual time um, on it, but where he doesn't actually play anything, but um, you hear him like open the piano and turn the pages and, you know, you hear him sit down. Um, and it, it was kind of like the video said, related to his understanding of Zen Buddhism. Um, and so here we have uh, Bruce now walking in an exaggerated manner around his studio. All right, we're not gonna watch the whole thing because it's time to look at this. Um, and so, you know, this is where artists are thinking, but uh, we do start to see artists um, use the idea of walking in art a little bit more and what the, what the agency of walking is, what the patterns of walking are. Right, we saw this one in the movie as well, dipping a necktie and paint. This one, the shoot, uh, Chris Burden, the, this is uh, really out there. Um, but we got to look at this within the kind of context of the Vietnam War. So we're just going to kind of um, take a quick peek here. All right. An arm by a friend of mine. Ah. 
I'm not sure exactly when I first came up with the idea. I mean, first of all, you saw a lot of people being shot on TV every night in Vietnam, guys my age. I got drafted, but I never went to Vietnam. Uh, lots of guys around me uh, were going. I became a marksman. We all became marksmen. But uh, guns uh, didn't, I didn't relate to guns and I didn't relate to shooting. And it was something that uh, I had to do going through that process. And then I got out of the Army and used my GI Bill to go back to school and, and went to Irvine. A bunch of us started this place called F Space, which was this industrial space. It was uh, just a couple doors down from my studio. All of us, I think, initially were doing painting and making sculpture and playing with the playing with the material objects and he was a little further over in a different direction we were all real curious what he was doing where he was coming from i knew i couldn't go down to the local gun store and ask you know hey is there a gun instructor you know who'd like to come and do an art performance where he kind of nicked my arm you know, I knew that wouldn't go over. You know, so you had to ask somebody who was a friend and who was willing to do it and liked your art. You know, otherwise you weren't going to get anywhere. Chris came to me and said uh, he's thinking of doing a, a piece where he gets shot. And uh, would I be the shooter? Would I be willing to work with him on it? And I liked the challenge and the idea of, of uh, shooting someone for art. And... Uh, doing the best job I could. The bullet would whiz by my arm and it would scratch it. And one drop of blood would roll down my forearm. That was the ideal, ideal. Yeah, he stood about 15 feet away from me. Um, you know, he asked if I was ready. I kind of stiffened up, stuck my left arm out a little so he'd have some shoot at. <laughs> He got shot, you know, he looked and everything looked okay. And we all went, well, okay, that worked. And it turned out to be a uh, flesh wound. He went in and out of my arm with a 22 bullet. Just like hitting a corner of a tractor trailer on a freeway, your arm just got nicked by a giant force, you know, it just goes numb. But then as he walked toward us, he began to get a little wobbly. So we all just kind of waited, uh, you know, Chris, you okay? And uh, we wanted to make sure that he wasn't going to pass out or we didn't have to call an ambulance or, or he wasn't going to bleed to death. And, you know, I don't think they believed me for a moment. They probably sh thought my wife had shot me and I wasn't pressing charges and it was in another city. I enjoyed the piece. Uh, I, I appreciated the significance of it even then. I always felt it was a, a very valid piece and, and an important thing that I, that I did and we did. I think a lot of those performance works were an attempt to control fate or something, or, or uh, giving you the illusion that you can control fate. <laughs> that that one really is uh it's pretty wild and uh whatever reaction you have to it is valid um uh, and this usually brings up a pretty pretty good debate in class uh so just kind of want to kind of let that be known um this is a, a really kind of poetic piece uh that she's looking at the kind of elastic in the stretching of it and the choreographed dancing as a metaphor for um, her and her uh, contemporaries is pushing the medium of um, young black uh, contemporary art and, and as being an artist. So kind of just a nice metaphor. Um, this one is also just uh, kind of out there, but it's a nice uh, snapshot of what was a longer performance piece but then also kind of lived on as a single frame. We've talked a lot about this piece, so I'm gonna kind of, um, we're not gonna talk about the content uh, concept necessarily, but just want to let it be known that, you know, 
the photograph here it has kind of been more significant than the actual I shouldn't say more significant. It is almost as significant as the actual performance itself, right? That this photograph is the actual kind of way um, that that this piece has been disseminated and has really risen in prominence. Um, and just to kind of uh, drive that that idea home is this was the second take, right? So we don't actually usually talk about the first urn that IOA dropped. It's usually all about this kind of photo. Um, so we can just see how uh, photo, video, et cetera, can be really powerful medium to help um, capture performance art. This is an interesting piece about asylum seekers. And uh, she, I, I believe she was in this uh, space for about a week and she didn't really talk to anybody and she just documented everything. Um, and so I really encourage you, um, if you're interested in like in performance art or asylum seeking um, or like kind of the duration of the performance pieces to just Google this real quick. And there's a really uh, beautiful website of just um, what people like, it just opens with a list of, of what people would say to her. Like, can you speak? Uh, are you the artist? Thank you for doing this. Are you crazy? Um, you know, it's just kind of, Oh, can you pass me that, that ball? Like the, I can't remember the football or volleyball that got got between there and, and she's not really engaging with the public right um and and when someone asks to do a favor and she kind of talks back on it she's like would you ask someone for a favor who's seeking asylum right so um she really kind of uh, went all out so um, a, a really interesting piece she didn't leave that space this is a um if you're into performance art the I can't even begin to um, sum up this artist's work, um, but I feel responsibility to include it in the lecture because if you're into performance art, this is an artist you've got to look into. Um, so that this is uh, this is kind of your own homework if you want to do a performance piece for a project or look into performance art a little bit more. Pussy Riot is a um, they're like a band, actually, like a punk band in Russia, but they stage these kind of protests. And um, if you're a punk rock fan at all, you got to look in, look into the band, uh, the punk prayer uh, as well. And they just, uh, they stage public protests in response to current events and people, people being held, um, you know, unjustly. And counting, um, this piece it, it, it's a it's pretty complex in its own way so i'm just going to read you a little bit from like from a statement in counting addresses uh the double standard um, as he turns his own body into a 24-hour live performance into a canvas his back tattooed with a borderless map of iraq covered with one dot for each Iraqi and American casualty near the cities where they fell. The 5,000 dead American soldiers are represented by red dots, permanently visible ink. And the 100,000 Iraqi casualties are represented by dots of green UV ink, seemingly invisible un unless under a black light. During the performance, people from all walks of life read off the names of the dead. And uh, this is really inspired because his brother was uh, killed by a missile at a checkpoint uh, near their hometown in Iraq in 2004. And he says he really feels the pain of both American and Iraqi families who have lost loved ones in the war, um, but that he feels the deaths of Iraqis like his brother are largely invisible to the American public. So. And we're going to watch this one because there's really no way to talk about it without seeing it. Thank you. 
kind of a cool process there from beginning to end uh, and an event that I would I would love to go to. Um, and that's not just like quarantine brain speaking. That's just uh, something I would like to do. But, so what sort of common themes or gestures can you identify in the performances we looked at so far? All right. So just uh, hopefully you can think about that. Um, we're going to look at en endurance performance art. Uh, we saw the kind of the one um, there, the the bamboo um, kind of jail cell right there on the on the beach. Um, but it refers to artworks generally performed over a long period of time that may test the physical or emotional stamina of the artist or the audience. All right. Um, Joseph Boys, uh, I like American, America likes me. This is probably uh, the kind of the earliest, uh, one of the earlier um, multi-day performances where he lived in the gallery with a coyote, believe it or not. This piece, um, rope piece, they stayed to tied together for an entire year. They didn't even, they didn't touch at all. Um, they went everywhere. They slept next to each other. Um, and uh, they didn't, as soon as they were done, you know, they hugged. But uh, kind of unfathomable, honestly. Another uh, same artist, one, one of the artists here, um, with uh, punching the time clock on the hour, one hour. So we're just gonna watch just a quick videos so you can kind of see the evolution of this because I think it, that is amazing in itself. Repetition. Oh, repetition. Yeah, yeah you, you can oh, see, you okay. Punch time for every hour is a depiction. But it, another way you see it is no depiction because every is a new, new hour. And life we we are in the process. My piece one year performed, uh, 1980, 81. I punch time for every hour on the hour, 24 hour, and the process in a whole year long. The subject is about time. So I document is the one frame. One year I pressure to six minutes and to see the, you know, the project in the six minutes for a whole year. and then come. It's most difficult is a uh, sleeping time. Right? So I have to wake up every hour on the hour. So I punch and I wait in for next hour. Every day life is the same. So most of the best life is waiting for next hour. All work I do, I know it's very difficult. I don't feel, you know, so suffer that time. I, I, I have a Pleasure, pleasure to do a piece. One year is a human calculator of life in case one unit. And this is a earth around the sun one year. So it's a very good in piece art to talk about what life means. And to me, in my philosophy of my whole life work, I would say life is life sentence, life is passion time, life is a free thinking. And Another mind-boggling piece there. Um, this would, you know, some some of these pieces don't age well, and I think this one might be one of those. Um, where this artist would just pick a stranger and follow them around, right? And uh, I think you know, if we were to do that today, you know, especially especially right now, we're kind of in quarantine, social isolation, it might might kind of uh, might be stalking, right? Um, so. Uh, it's just kind of interesting to see how these two things do th go through time. Um, this is a piece where the artist, uh, the maybe, is kind of, this one's uh, no real statement to this, but they are napping in the, in the foyer of a museum. Nothing to do, uh, kind of scooting around this pile on their knees slowly. 
and, and uh, the video is exactly as it sounds. And so we're just gonna move over it. Um, this one, when faith moves mountains, this one, this one's pretty beautiful actually. Um, everyone here with a shovel, um, kind of digging and then moving a pile uphill. And so it's like a metaphor, right? Um, all these people of uh, same or similar faith, um, literally moving the mountain uphill, right? Even just by a foot. And so it's kind of a nice metaphor. And sometimes making something leads to nothing. This guy's making a piece of art, right? But he's actually pushing a block of ice around the city in Mexico City. Imagine it's a, it's a hot city until the block of ice turns into nothing. Audience-based performance art. This is kind of one of the more, um, seems to have a little more recognition and more practice uh, currently, um, where the performative elements becomes enacted by an audience or viewer. And Yoko Ono's cut piece, which we saw, uh, in Caitlyn Jenner and in the um, case for performance art video. All right, oops, in 2000, uh, this gal uh, went to all these guys' houses like on a dating site and then uh, kind of recorded it, uh, these kind of crazy um, videos. It, it seems, you know, potentially dangerous, but um, ended up, um, and so I guess some of them having having just some like goofy time. Uh, we saw this one as well, right? Um, kind of questioning the relationship between the female body and objectification uh, with men. Untitled plot for dialogue. I, I love the setting of this. Um, we've got like a badminton court going on in here. It's a or tennis court rather, um, but uh, as a place for dialogue. Um, and, and right, the artist is, is kind of hosting these games and people come up and play. Uh, this, they kind of say, is not complete without someone entering it. We're going to look at these artists again. Um, but they're, they really kind of blur the line between installation and performance art. And... So that's, that's why I'm leaving it in here. I, I think you can make a case of this as actually just installation art, but they view themselves as performance artists in some way also. We'll, we'll revisit them in just a couple weeks. Punch Me Panda by Nate Hill. Oh, this is, this is good stuff. Just, no. All right, let's see if we can get there. I just, just changed the video too. There's this idea that in portraiture, it's the photographer's job to set the subject at ease. I, I, I... Nate Hill is suiting up for another day as New York's very own Punch Me Panda. The 33-year-old performance artist hits Manhattan's busiest streets at least once a week and lets New Yorkers take their best shot. I could tell it was a symbiotic relationship, a mutual benefit between between me and the panda, and we both felt so good afterwards. That feel-good bond is exactly what Punch Me Panda sets out to achieve. He takes his beatings free of charge and says it's a way to reach out and empathize with folks who are stressed out or just plain mad. The purpose of Punch Me Panda is to give like a community service to people where they can have some kind of free relief on the street, like physical relief. A quick jab is a good release for Tiana Robinson, who pictures someone else with each punch. Yeah, my friend said it would be a good idea. I'm going through like relationship issues, and she's like, punch the pen, then pretend it's the guy that you're dealing with. So I'm like, oh, that sounds like a good idea. You know, you can take a cue from dogs. Dogs, when they're, you know, when they're going through something, it's cold, they're upset or whatever, they just shake it out and it's better. But not every New Yorker reacts to a man in an animal suit with violence. Hill says his panda therapy is not just a joke. Some days he goes on home visits or he waits outside businesses expecting layoffs. And for the next five months, he'll suit up and invite New Yorkers to let off some steam one punch at a time. Good stuff there, Punchy Panda. 
a couple of videos coming up, but um, bear with me here while I get this going again. Uh, and Jay Z Picasso's baby, uh, you know, we can think, we can. Rap is thinking out loud, and you putting your fears and your vulnerabilities and your insecurities to music. Concerts are pretty much performance art. And the smaller venue is a bit more intimate, so you feel the energy of the people. <laughs> World premiere exclusive. Jason's Picasso Baby, Friday, August 2nd. So he calls it a performance art film. Um, he's been criticized a little bit for monopolizing or trying to monetize, rather, pardon me, um, the performance art uh, kind of genre a little bit. But he does have it. Marina Abramovich's kind of stamp of approval there. She's in it as well. And we're going to move on into her because she is probably the most famous performance artist ever and um, we'll, we'll uh, stop and take a look at a couple pieces in particular um, but a lot of them are endurance and um, and highly political uh, pieces the rhythm five here um, rhythm zero certainly her most uh, it's what really put her on the map I should say where she allowed she presented herself as an object and allowed the um, audience to kind of do whatever they would to her and she assumed full responsibility. So we'll see um, that film in just a moment. And her and her partner, Ule, were, uh, they were performance artists together and life partners uh, until they broke up. And when they broke up, they actually walked 2,000 miles, I think took three months each, um, 2,000 miles each, took three months to meet in the middle on the Great Wall of China where they um, hugged and said goodbye to each other. Um, so, you know, she's like, you know, we didn't just talk on the phone or in person or uh, like normal people, right? They walked the Great Wall of China, but kind of speaks to their eccentric relationship. And so a lot of their work was also about trust, right? So we can see here that arrow is pointed at her heart and she's leaning back as he is too. Um, and, and, you know, one slip. Um, could be could be fatal there, um, but and here's that piece in 1988 of them walking the Great Wall. This is a piece of her uh, living in a gallery uh, and kind of unable to get down. Right, we can if we look closely at the ladder, it is um, knives. Right, so she kind of the feeling of being trapped that uh, maybe we all feel right now here in quarantine. And um, I'm just gonna kind of move on uh, to just a couple of these videos. And first looking at Rhythm Zero. One of my most extreme pieces was when I really pushed my body to the limits because I did never want to die. I'm not interested in dying, but I'm interested in how far you can push the energy of the human body, how far you can go, and then see that, that actually our energy is almost limitless. It's not about the body, it's about the mind who push you to the extremes that you never could imagine. Some of the work what really got lots of attention to the public was uh, Rhythm Zero. Uh, till that time, the artist of performance art was totally uh, ridiculous, and the thing that was sick, and there was exhibitionist, and there was masochist, and they just want attention. So I was just really tired of this kind of critics, and I said, okay, I'm going to make the piece to see how far public can go if the artist himself doesn't do anything. And there, very simply, um, I uh, put on the table 72 objects with the uh, instructions, I'm an object, you can do whatever you want to do with me, and uh, I will take all responsibility for six hours. On the table was a rose, perfume, piece of bread, and grapes, and wine, and, and then was objects like uh, really scissors, and nails, and uh, metal bar, and uh, finally was also pistol with one bullet. So basically the audience wanted to put a bullet into pistol and kill me. And I really want to take this risk. I want to know what is the public about, and how, what they're going to do in this kind of situation. 
it was really difficult piece because I just stood there in the front of the table. And in the beginning, nothing really happened. Public would come, they would play with me, they would give me roles, they would kiss me, look at me. And then public became more and more wild. They cut uh, my neck and drink my blood. They carry me around, put me on the table, open my legs, I put a knife between the one person took the pistol, put the bullet, and see if I would really, with my own hand, push the target. The galleries came and completely go crazy, take this gun out of his hand, throw out of the window. They took scissors, they cut my clothes, they put rose pins into my body. After six hours, which was like a two in the morning, the galleries come and say the performance is over. I uh, start moving and start being myself because I was there like a puppet just for them. And that moment, everybody ran away. People could not actually uh, confront with, my, with me as, as a person. I remember going back to hotel, looking in the mirror, and I found a big piece of white hair. So that piece is in stark contrast to the next one um, where she's really testing the public and finding some, you know, not so um, admirable traits in, uh, in people, right? And I always love to imagine, um, you know, that gray hair showing up and uh, I always like to hear what you, what you all think if that's, uh, if, if that's real or not, right? So here, and here's the artist's present and this is gonna be um, kind of your homework just for 60 seconds with, with uh, someone, with your roommate, with a family member, uh, whoever, whoever you would like to. For artists is present, I decide to be there in MoMA the entire duration of the time of the opening of the museum, which means three months sitting there. I knew this is a big chance to show the power of performance art. I prepare for this piece almost a year because I knew it's going to be physically so demanding, so difficult. The curator was just telling me, you have to be ready that in the front of you will be empty chair most of the time. Because nobody could imagine in New York, the most busy place in the world, that would anybody take time to sit and just engage in mutual gaze with me. So it was complete surprise for myself, to the entire staff of MoMA and to everybody else this enormous need of the humans to actually have a contact, how we are so alienated from each other, how the society makes us really distant. You know, we are texting each other messages without seeing each other, and we just live around the corner from each other. So many stories of loneliness. And uh, the people not that just occupy the chair, there was no one second when this chair was empty. They start sleeping outside of the museum and they start waiting for hours and hours and coming back. And what is happening there? I'm looking at you. You're photographed, you're filmed. You're observed by the, everybody else in this art room. So there's nowhere to go but into yourself. At the moment when you really get into yourself, that moment burst with emotions, with so much feelings. And this is why so many people start crying. They become such important experience in their life. We are not doing this in our own home because we are doing everything to actually cut that relation to ourselves. But here I made a stage for the audience that they can be able to do that. So something really happened there, which was different than anything I've done ever before. And during that time, city. This idea of the Marina Bramwich Institute, my, came to my mind. It was so clear that I have to do something about this experience. So it starts to get to be a little bit of an infomercial there, but uh, I just kind of want to bring us back here to, um, you know, good social distance there at six feet, right? Um, no, but um, you can do this with anyone you want to. I'm asking you to do a minimum of 60 seconds. Uh, you can do it, you know, as long as you would like to. But I think that what she does so well is that the the viewer really completes most of the of, of her really recognizable pieces, right? Rhythm Zero, we saw um, some really uh, undesirable kind of social experiment 
and, and the way that people really did end up treating her like an object. And then he, in this um, more recent work, how we have this really innate desire to connect with other people, right? And uh, I think, you know, I don't want to spoil your experience, but uh, a lot of times when we, we would do this in class, there's, you know, there's a little bit of giggling on the, on the front end and uh, you know there's maybe a little discomfort or something like that but but I, I do think uh, that you'll find that you push through that fairly easily so I hope that you you can have some fun with this and um, just give me a little bit of a written response on it on blackboard and uh, I appreciate um, hearing anything you have uh, the good the bad the ugly uh, about this experience uh, so thank you <laughs>